we're recording. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Brain and Nervous System Masterclass. I'm Michael, I'll be your host. I am joined this time by Dr. Kat Toops. Dr. Toops, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this is going to be fun. Um, this is a unique presentation, not only in the content we're going to be talking about dementia, um, but also in that this presenter has dealt with the condition that she's going to present on. And so if you'd like, I would be totally open to giving you the floor here to share a little bit about your own story, because I think it's, it's really important that people hear this, not only the content that you're going to present, which is super important and amazing in itself, but like what you've been through personally, and that when people hear the word dementia, it doesn't mean that there's a death sentence or this is the way it's going to go and that there's nothing you can do. Exactly. Okay, well, let me give you a little um, context. So um, my background is as an Alzheimer's researcher and a clinician. Oh yeah, hang on. Let me actually, I, I was so excited. I totally skipped the bio. So <laughs> let me jump into that. I was context. so excited to get to your story. We just talked about it. Hang on. Uh, okay. You're a um, MD, uh, Distinguished Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, board certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, and previously boarded in geriatric psych psychiatry. You're also a certified practitioner with the Institute for Functional Medicine, like many of our presenters for this event. Um, you were formerly an assistant professor of psychiatry at UC Davis, that's where my wife went to school, where she was the inpatient residency training director and later the founder and medical director of the Bay Area Research Institute, a clinical trials research center in Lafayette, California for 12 years. And after serving as the principal investigator on over 100 clinical trials, including 20 failed trials for Alzheimer's medication, she realized that the elusive cure for brain and psychiatric illness was not going to be found in a pill. Um, there's a lot more here. I want to get to your story, but it mentioned that you're currently collaborating with Dr. Dale Bredesen, who many watching this are probably familiar with, uh, on a prospective clinical trial using a functional medicine method to reverse mild cognitive impairment in early dementia, and the study publication should be coming early next year. Uh, you told me that your portion of it is pretty much done, that his portion is not quite yet completed, but will be done soon, and you're finishing up a book called Dementia Demystified, The Definitive Guide to Resurrecting Your Brain, Reversing Cognitive Decline, and Regaining Your Memory. <laughs> That's a mouthful, isn't it? You've been busy for a long time. <laughs> so um, I apologize. I was so excited to get to your story. I told oh, you. No. I forget everybody doesn't know. So It's, it's wonderful. And and um, and uh, before I get into the story, I, I, I should just give a little thumbnail on our clinical trials. So um, as uh, Michael mentioned, I, I've been working with Dale Bredesen on this trial for a couple of years. It's been in the works for several years. And um, there's three investigators, myself and uh, Dr. Ann Hathaway and Dr. Deborah Gordon. And so we've um, conducted this trial at three different sites and we've applied a functional medicine approach that I'm gonna to talk to you about today to, to reverse dementia. So um, my, I've had 10 patients complete the study at my site. It was a nine month trial. And I just can't wait to share our data with the world. It's super exciting. Basically all 10 of my patients have improved and eight of the 10, I would say quite dramatically improved. Uh, more than half of them would no longer qualify to be in the study. They're testing out as pretty much completely normal. So it's just, it's, it's hard work to reverse dementia, but it can be done. And that's the most important thing that I wanna share with people today. So let me tell you a little bit about my story. As Michael said, I was um, an Alzheimer's researcher and, um, and basically about 11 years ago when I turned 50, I developed dementia. So I was running my clinical trials research center and I was doing you know, quite a few long-term Alzheimer trials. And I gradually came to realize that I was as cognitively impaired as my patients. So I would give them three words to remember in the mini mental status exam that we did to assess the cognition. And I, I would have to write down those three words to quiz my patients a few minutes later because I couldn't remember them. And I had two sets of three words that I used and I would use one one time and one the next, but um, I just couldn't remember those words. That was my biggest clue. Uh, I had obviously been struggling um, and I'd used that uh, test for more than 20 years. 
So it was something that I knew like the back of my hand and I couldn't remember. Um, I developed visual spatial problems. So I completely lost the ability in my car to parallel park or back up the car. I would just try over and over like to get into a parallel parking spot and I would just give up and go look for another parking place because I could no longer complex, I, I couldn't sequence those complex motor tasks anymore. And one day my husband was in the car with me and, and he said, what's wrong with you? You're driving like a little old lady. And I said, I don't know, there's too many things happening when you're driving. And I was just overwhelmed because my processing speed was so impaired that I couldn't just sequence all those things that happen automatically to us when we're driving. So at that time, I wasn't even thinking in terms of processing speed or visual spatial sequencing. I was just trying to function and get through each day. I developed trouble using a computer. I would ask my husband to show me things on the computer because I couldn't remember how to do them. And he would get annoyed with me because he'd say, well, I just showed you that. But I couldn't even remember that he had shown me. And I would get confused dialing a phone number. So normally I could hold those seven numbers in my head and dial a phone number, but I kept messing up and I would have to sometimes dial a phone several times over to, to uh, complete a call and, and it kept getting worse. So then I developed auditory processing problems. I was having such a hard time hearing that I kept going to my ENT and asking for hearing aids. And he would tell me that I just had a mild hearing loss and that I didn't need hearing aids. Um, but I, I couldn't understand things. If I walked into a room and my husband was watching TV, I would ask him if they were mumbling on the TV. And one night I actually had this very horrifying experience. I was having dinner with a couple of friends and it was a quiet restaurant late at night. And suddenly I couldn't understand what they were saying. I was just getting a little snatch of every word and I couldn't decode the words. And I was just trying to keep my fear at bay. So I sat back and I read my emails because I couldn't participate in the conversation. So the next day I called my ENT right away and I said, just give me those hearing aids because I cannot hear. And he looked at me funny and he shook his head and he said, you know, the problem isn't in your ear, it's in your brain. And it turned out that I had actually developed auditory processing problems. So it wasn't my hearing, my brain could not decode properly what was being said. So in a nutshell, I had developed dementia. My brain was degenerating. Uh, but, but who thinks of dementia in a 50 year old? I only figured that out retrospectively that what was happening to me was dementia. At that time, as I mentioned, I was just trying to survive. And I had developed an autoimmune disease that manifested at that point as multiple chemical sensitivity. So I became allergic to just about everything. I was covered with rashes, covered with hives. I was up all night putting on lotions and topical steroids, trying to get relief from the itching and get some sleep. I had severe fatigue. I could barely get out of a chair for a year. And if I did manage to leave the house and walk into a store, just the smells of the chemicals would worsen my rashes and my itching and my fatigue and my brain fog. Well, I had treated enough patients with dementia to know that when someone develops dementia in their 50s, it progresses much more rapidly than the later onset dementia that occurs after 65. So I feel like if I hadn't discovered functional medicine, I would either have been drooling in a nursing home a long time ago, or you know, possibly not even been around anymore um, because that was 11 years ago. So really what I'd like to do is give you some information about the, the things that I've learned to reverse my own dementia and um, more about what I and the others in my, you know, um, my Bredesen study group, uh, we're constantly working on pushing the envelope, what kind of new treatments, you know, can we come up with and, um, and definitely, um, hopefully leave everybody with a message that dementia is not a death sentence, that there's definitely things we can do um, and discover and treat to reverse this, this problem that everyone is so afraid of. That's incredible because uh, no one would ever be able to tell that you had all those things going on if they met you now. You're <laughs> like very quick, very sharp, very on the ball with everything that's said. And it's amazing. Um, and I didn't even know the extent to which these things could be reversed until I recorded 
a lot of the presentations for this masterclass, I knew a lot of progress had been made that these things can be slowed down, uh, that they might be able to be halted or that there may be some like minor improvements that could be made. I had no idea the, the progress that was being made and, and what's possible. So it's, it's really exciting. So yeah, go ahead. If you want to, now would be the time if you want to yeah. hit the, the screen share, we can go into your, your presentation. I'll be, I'm taking notes here right along with everybody else. Okay. And I might ask you a couple questions either during or after and but I am the audience with them right now. So okay, great. I'll mostly stay out of your way. Okay, hop in anytime you like. All right. Um, I love questions. I like to make sure people understand. I'm going to be talking a little bit quickly because I have so much to say. I told Michael I could use two hours for a talk, and actually I could use two days for a talk. <laughs> okay. Let well, me see. judging by some of the experience I've had with some of these presentations, a second one of these is probably warranted to go into further detail on some of the topics that we've only uh, peeked into. So there may be a 2.0 version of this one coming next year. Okay, great. And, and I, you know, I think a lot of the stuff I share is going to, you know, the, your other talks that you've had will all be incorporated in the same approaches that I sure. use. Yeah, great. many of them are familiar with your work. So uh, I think uh, Datis and Titus and Ken, Charlene and a couple others uh, said they were pretty familiar with what you were doing. So yeah, we're we're all coming at it. It takes a village to, yeah. you know, there's nobody with a single answer, and we all constantly learn from each other, and and that's what it takes. So I have lots of different study groups, and we all put our heads together. So um, can you hit the uh, slideshow uh, button? Let's see if I didn't do it. It's up on the top in the middle. The top in the middle. You are right screen. below your arrow there. Wait, top in the Slide middle. Slideshow, down, up, right below the title, up on the top. Right uh, there. That. Yep. And then from the beginning on the. OK. OK, got it. Oh, good. There good. you go. And you should just be able to click. I didn't know you're in Walnut Creek. My grandmother-in-law, I guess I would be called, Mira's grandma, uh -huh. uh, lives in Walnut Creek. It's nice yeah. over there. Yeah, that's where my office is, and I live right next door in Lafayette, but okay. it's a wonderful area. Well, when, when things go back to where people can see each other, let's have lunch. For sure. All right. Okay, so here's that first message. Dementia is both preventable and treatable when we find and correct the underlying causes. So um, Alzheimer's, I wanna to say too, I sometimes use Alzheimer's and dementia interchangeably. Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. There's many different types of dementia and um, kind of just as my shift from a traditional psychiatrist to a functional psychiatrist, where in, in functional psychiatry, I don't care what the name of the disease is. I just care what's causing it and how can I fix all of those root causes to correct the disease. So it's the same thing with dementia. Um, there's definitely different types of dementia and they may have differing responses to treatment, but still the approach in the beginning is to look at what are all of the causes. So, um, so my thinking is that, you know, Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative disorder, but it's not really this mysterious, untreatable brain disease that just happens. So it's potentially reversible and it's a multi-system illness. It's never due to just one thing or almost never due to just one thing. It occurs due to toxins and infections and inflammation and lack of hormones and lack of nutrients and other diet and lifestyle factors. And it has a strong autoimmune component as well. So there's reasons that this happens and, and our job is to find and address all of the different driving factors and then we can gain traction in, in at least stopping and hopefully even reversing the degenerative process if we get it before it's too late. Um, so here's some of the contributing factors in, in dementia. Um, there may be, a, as I mentioned, it's usually not one thing, but there may be a proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. Like sometimes we'll see somebody that has a surgery with general anesthesia, which is a known risk factor for dementia, or they'll have an accident and, and it's just the straw that breaks the camel's back and suddenly people will notice that uh, they really are struggling with their memory. 
Um, so we have to look at all of these factors, the metabolic factors like high lipids, high blood sugar, high blood pressure, obesity, nutritional factors, toxins, um, inflam inflammatory issues, infections, which I'll definitely say a lot more about, um, autoimmune issues, chronic stress is a risk factor for uh, dementia, depression and chronic stress both can cause atrophy of the hippocampus, which is our memory center. Head trauma, of course, can cause uh, brain degeneration and um, also very important, withdrawal of trophic support, trophic hormones. So trophic means life-giving and, and and we need hormones to act as messengers in our bodies and control many things. And uh, uh, one of the things that we find, um, I'll say a little bit more about later, but when we lose our hormones at menopause and andropause, um, there's receptors in our brain that uh, start to degenerate without those hormones. So once we can find all these factors and fix all these factors, uh, then we can turn to neuroplasticity to help regenerate our brain. So, um, so uh, when I went to medical school in the 80s, we were taught that by 18, we had all the neurons we were going to have, and it was just downhill from there. Well, that's a pretty grim picture, and thank God it turns out not to be true. Um, so they know now that we can continue to make new connections in our brain up until the time of death. There literally was a study uh, some years ago where they put people that were terminal and about to die, and they put them in scanners, and they gave them brain tasks to do, and they actually could show that they were still making new connections in their brains. So um, as part of the, the ways to get our brains back online, we need to do things to enhance neuroplasticity. And, um, and I'll say some more about that in a little while. Okay, functional medicine. I think you've had a lot of talks about functional medicine and it, it doesn't feel new anymore. I think it's been around for 20 years, but for some people it's still new. And as I mentioned, functional medicine is really, we wanna know the root cause of illness. What is causing this? Why does the person have it? And once we can figure all of that kind of stuff out, then we have our treatment targets to help people get better. So to halt my own dementia, as I studied every single module in functional medicine, I had to apply every single thing to myself to, to get well. Um, so I've been a good learning experiment on myself. Um, so in psychiatry, I was trained to specialize in the brain. I had training in psychiatry and neurology and geriatric psychiatry. And basically we focused on diseases that affect the brain. Um, and they taught me to use this medication for this condition. Well, those medications could definitely help relieve symptoms and they can help relieve suffering. So they're definitely useful, but medications generally don't get people truly well. They're designed to manage the symptoms, but not to create wellness. So as Michael mentioned in his introduction, what I finally figured out, because I did all these drug studies, I did over hundred drug studies in my clinical trials research center. And every time I got a study with a new mechanism of action, I would get excited. Oh, great. There's this new mechanism of action. This is going to help my patients. And, you know, Many of them, you know, did help to some degree, but I finally realized that was not the panacea and that wasn't, was, wasn't enough to get people well. Um, so, you know, we know that our bodies are designed to heal themselves. We wouldn't have survived all these years without modern medicine and, you know, uh, historical times. Um, but these days we have so many things in our world. So many things are so toxic. And so our bodies need a lot more help to uh, remove all the things that are injuring them. So um, in the brain, um, what I have come to realize is uh, my training compartmentalized the brain from the body. We dealt with the brain. We didn't deal with the body. We didn't deal with all of these medical conditions and hormonal conditions and toxic conditions. We just dealt with the brain, but really the brain is connected to the body. So it turns out what happens in the body is what happens in the brain. And and so when the brain is struggling, I've learned to you know, look at the body and look what's happening in the body to start to understand what's deficient and how we can fix things. Um, so I think of my what I, the work I do with dementia, I think of it as the three R's. Um, we need to remove, replace, and regenerate. So we want to remove all the factors that are weakening or hurting the body and the brain. 
we need to replace all those nutrients and hormones that the brain and the body are lacking and, and need to heal. And then once we have removed and replaced, and of course it's not, it's not once you, <clears throat> you do it from the beginning, but you, there's all kinds of steps you can do to help regenerate your brain and to help regrow damaged connections in those neurons. So I'm gonna say a little bit about senior moments. Um, what are things, what are things, how might things look when you're starting to have some cognitive decline and uh, people, you know, notice little changes and they, they tend to have an intuitive sense that they're beginning to have trouble with their memory. And I tell you, these days we're seeing it earlier and earlier than we used to. And I do think it's a reflection of uh, both the toxicity of our world and the stress of our world right now. I'm um, paying really close attention. I've had some M40 and uh, I've experienced, I have several concussions in my life. Mm -hmm. I had a really unhealthy lifestyle for most of my life until I was around 30-ish. Mm -hmm. And um, lots of drinking, lots of toxic, lots of food that's not good, lots of, uh, I didn't go to sleep before midnight probably once for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm noticing little, little things. And so I'm definitely paying attention. Yes, and, and that is, of course, where it's at. We want people to notice these things and you know get the impetus to change things so that we don't have to undo things when they're really bad. So some of the kind of things people notice, they might have trouble finding the right word to say, or sometimes they'll even say the wrong word. And they might start having trouble remembering people's names that they should remember or dropping a ball or two because they forgot a task they were supposed to do. Sometimes they will forget recent travels or important events. Um, some people start misplacing things or losing things. They find they're always looking for things. Um, other people find they're having trouble with directions or getting to familiar places and they can become overly reliant on their GPS. So I have to say, I think we're all becoming more overly reliant on our GPS. It is a, a wonderful thing, but, um, but when you can't get to familiar places without using your GPS, then that's a tip off. Um, some people start having trouble with math, like calculating a tip. They used to be able to do it in their head and now they have trouble with that. And recipes are an interesting tip off as well. Um, following a recipe and or cooking a meal is a very complex event that takes a lot of you know planning and organization and timing so um, people will maybe start eating simpler and simpler foods or even stop cooking or they just may have a global sense of overwhelm or feeling like things are just harder to accomplish than it used to be so you're having a little memory problem you go to your doctor and the doctor usually just reassures you and says, well, it's normal to have some changes in your memory when you age. So really, I don't think there's anything to worry about. And I strongly disagree with this. So Michael, just like what you were saying, you know, we've got to pay attention to that little intuitive spidey sense we have. And, and it's not normal to lose your memory with aging. And there are plenty of people in their 90s that are sharp as a tack. And so we need to know what are they doing? What is their secret? You know, why has their memory been preserved when other people like me at 50, you know, are going downhill fast? So I do feel like when people feel like they're starting to have trouble with their memory, they really are. And we actually have a term for it now and it's called subjective cognitive impairment. So it may not be yet measurable, but when you feel subjectively like you have a problem, you should listen to that. I wanna give you an example of how this played out with one of my patients. So I had a patient um, that was in my dementia clinical trial and he was tested several years ago so that the, on the left side of my uh, slide here, 2016 was some testing, <clears throat> excuse me, that he had. He went to his doctor and said, I feel like I'm having trouble with my memory. Well, this patient is a physician, an MD physician, and he's also an engineer and an inventor and, you know, as a startup company. Um, so obviously somebody with a very high Q, a lot of education. And he did relatively well on his test and, and his overall total score there was in the 79th percentile. But look at that delayed memory. That is in the 18th percentile. And the way you think about this is 50% is average. So if you look at the average person of average IQ, it would be around 50%. Now we would expect this person with his advanced degrees to have 
probably quite a bit higher level than the 50th percentile. But he was down to 18%. And what did they tell him? They said, well, really, you only have one score that's a little low. So, you know, there's not really much wrong here. And you should just try to exercise and reduce your stress. So he felt reassured and he did nothing. He did nothing. He felt reassured. They told him he was okay. But what happened was he continued to decline. And three years later, now he's 63 years old. He actually met the criteria to be enrolled in my clinical trial for dementia. Um, he had mild, mild cognitive impairment. Actually, he, was, he actually was scoring fairly low at that time, come to think of it. And so look at what happened when we tested him. This was a year ago in um, 11 of 2019. So um, his worst score again was his verbal memory. They were different tests, so I don't have exact comparisons there, but, <clears throat> but basically we can see that in the repeat testing, his verbal memory is down to the seventh percentile. Uh, you don't have to be a statistician to know that that sucks, right? So he had declined more than 50% in his verbal memory in these three years. And so we lost all this valuable time that he could have been addressing these factors that were driving his neurodegeneration. Because that's what happens when you're having trouble with your memory, your brain is slowly degenerating. So definitely pay attention to that. And I have to tell you at the end of my nine month trial, his verbal memory is now testing at the 92nd percentile. That's where this man belongs, right? He's in the, you know, wow, that's crazy. top 10%. So we can see that he was declining, 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 but you know, in looking at all of the factors for him and all the hard work that he put in to follow the protocol, um, you know, he's, he's now doing so much better. So don't be fooled by age. Um, this physician first presented at 60 and even then 60, you know, 10 years ago, nobody would have thought anybody would be having memory problems at 60, but we're definitely seeing people earlier and earlier with all the pollution, the toxicity. Um, actually in my trial, five of my 10 patients in the trial were under 65. And one of them was only 58. So we're not talking about, you know, 75, 85 year old people here. Um, these are, you know, uh, younger, younger people. So I want to come back now to my three R's and, and tell you a little bit more about them. And I'll try to weave in some ideas that people can do just to help mitigate their own decline and, and to be more aware of the different kind of factors that we test and address. Um, and that way you don't have to just sit and wait for your brain to decline to the point that they say, oh, now you have dementia, get your affairs in order. But a point that I really want to make is even then, it's not too late. I do not like my patients to go to the, you know, the academic neurology center and get a diagnosis of dementia because they are told to go and get their affairs in order and explain, you know, the timeline of their decline. And when people buy into that and they believe that, that's what's going to happen. So I really want people to get the message that no, this isn't a death sentence. We can fix things and you don't have to get your affairs in order and wait to decline. Okay, so the first R is to remove. Now, these are some of the factors that, um, that we look at and um, infections are high up on my list. I'll show you a, a slide coming up with some of the infections that we look at. Toxins, and these are chemical toxins, um, heavy metal toxins, mycotoxins from the mold. Um, I don't know if you've had a talk on that. That's a whole talk in of itself, but I'll say a little bit more uh, about that. And, you know, the toxins that we use to clean our houses, things in our water, all the Roundup that's sprayed on our crops these days, even if you're eating organic food, I'm told that there's so much Roundup or glyphosate sprayed that it basically is... It, it takes up into the atmosphere and comes down in the rain. So even the organic crops can sadly be contaminated these days. And mercury is an important thing to take note of. Um, it's turning up rather frequently in our cognitive decline patients. One of my friends and colleagues presented data at the IFM annual meeting a year or two ago, and she analyzed all of her cognitive patients that she was treating, and she looked at their, their metals levels. And she found that on average, her cognitive patients had twice as high a mercury level as the age match controls. And it's not that hard, interestingly, to get rid of mercury. So um, 
the, you know, there may be people that, that still have mercury fillings and we definitely like to have people address that at the right time in their treatment. But so much of it is coming from the seafood that people are eating. And, um, and so what I have my patients do is for four to six months, I'll have them just stop eating seafood altogether, except for maybe uh, some scallops or deveined shrimp. Those tend to be very low in mercury. And, um, and then we give them liver support, like um, broccoli extract that upregulates the, um, the phase two. Um, here's a slide on it, okay. That uh, the bro broccoli extract or sulforaphanes are actually really excellent at upregulating um, phase two detox enzymes. There's one that I especially like that uh, called Avmacol that actually does research and has beautiful data showing that they upregulate over 200 phase two detox enzymes. Um, so you That's can- That's been part of our protocol for Mira for two years. Been we on use, the we use Avma call, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I think it's a, a wonderful cell and it really helps brain fog, um, actually sometimes for, for quite dramatically for people. So it's a, it's a really good, it's inexpensive. You can, you know, buy it directly from the company on their website and, um, and it's a really good, good uh, for detox support. But the best way we know besides avoidance and stopping eating the seafood for a while is, is to um, sweat. And so there's beautiful data showing that sweating like saunas or exercise to the point that you're sweating well, will help you to excrete toxins and metals both. And so, um, so we really do have a lot of our patients on sauna protocols. And one thing that's very important to know though, is when you're sweating, so you're mobilizing these toxins out of your body and it's coming out through your skin, you need to be wiping off the sweat as it comes out. And then after you finish your sauna or your exercise, go jump in the shower and wash all of those toxins off with soap um, so that you can get them out of your body. But uh, there's been beautiful research. Um, there's a researcher up in Toronto named Stephen Genuis. Uh, he's an MD PhD and he's shown us lots and lots of study and data that we can uh, get rid of our our toxins by uh, sweating. And I should mention there's a beautiful uh, an interesting study that was that came out of Finland about a year and a half ago. And in Finland, um, sauna is kind of part of their cultural heritage. And a lot of people traditionally have done sauna every single day. So they, they took a cohort of elderly men and looked at their sauna habits and then looked at their dementia risk over time. And they found that the men who did sauna every single day had a very low risk for dementia. And then the men who did it three times a week had a higher risk for dementia. And then the men who did it once a week or less, a higher risk for dementia. So it doesn't, the study wasn't designed to say sauna prevents dementia, but it's a pretty suggestive study. And we just, we know that sweating, actually sweating has been part of many um, uh, cultures, um, you know, the, the baths and the sweating and the sweat lodges. So many traditional cultures have incorporated sweating into their, um, their practices, their religious practices, their daily practices. So um, the sweating is definitely something to keep on the radar. Okay, the mold I mentioned, mold, as I said, it's a topic for a very long lecture, but it's really important to understand that mycotoxins, which are given off by certain types of molds are actually neurotoxic. And they literally can eat up the brain and cause dementia even in young people. So when we inhale these mycotoxins, they travel through our nose and they go up the back of our nose. There's this little bony plate that's porous with holes in it called the cribriform plate. And, and so things that are inhaled go right through our nose and into our brain. Um, and so it's, it's become really these days, I'm actually asking all of my patients with cognitive problems to test their homes for levels of mycotoxins. I mean, typically I would ask, do you, have you had, you know, floods in your house? Have you had a broken water heater? Have you had some water damage? And now I just think it's such an important issue that I'm just having people test their homes and let's get a baseline of that up front um, to see what happens. And I've seen people where I had somebody in my study where the um, one of the partners in the study had was really having problems with dementia, 
but his spouse was also having memory problems. And one of the big things we turned up was a lot of uh, mold problems in their home. And so especially if there's more than one person in a household having problems, you want to be looking at what's going on in your household. So um, there's a home mold test that people can do. It's from a company called uh, Mycometrics. You can see the website here, mycometrics.com. There's two different versions. There's a $150 test that tests the top five mold spores that are um, that are more likely to cause illness um, but um, it, the mold inspectors tell me it's much more effective to do the $300 test that tests uh, I don't know uh, quite a bit more on there um, because they can see different patterns in that so if the score turns up to be high with a moldy index that one will be more useful um, but once we get the scores from Mycometrics, you can go to the second website called myhousemakesmesick.com and you can put in the scores for some of those molds and it gives us a, what's called a hurts me too index. And that's a general moldiness index for your home. So what, what you do with this, this testing is you're collecting dust in your home because the spores will settle down into the dust. And so we can um, test what's there in the dust. And so when you get those scores, it'll tell you like, okay, this is generally considered safe or this is questionable, you better examine or this is really too high and it's a problem for everyone. Um, now we've seen sometimes they come back normal and other markers are telling us still that there's a problem and then we get inspectors and, and it's not a 100% foolproof test, but it's a good place to start. And before I leave the mold, subject i want to also mention to people that you should never clean your mold with bleach uh, i know if most of us have been told that for decades just spray a little bleach on it and it'll kill it well it turns out the mold actually aggravates it's aggravated by the bleach and it causes it to give off those mycotoxins that go into the air and then can poison us so um so just clean if you have some mold clean it with soap and water and elbow grease and and then of course investigate farther if um, if your scores are high. So infections are another huge thing with dementia and there are so many infections that get into the brain. I um, I have a two page list of things that I've found and studied and I'm sure there's more of them. I'm just you know always trying to understand what are these infections that are getting in the brain, but here's a list of some of the things that I look at and then I test for, and I literally will test for all of these in my patients. Um, Epstein-Barr um, and herpes simplex one, those are two things that a large majority of us have had. Um, Epstein-Barr is a uh, mono, mononucleosis, or can cause chronic fatigue, and it often happens in um, teenagers. And herpes simplex one is when you get the cold sores, um, and they find in, when they look at the brains of people that died with Alzheimer's, like so very high percentage of them have large amounts of herpes simplex one in their brain. We've seen Epstein-Barr in the brain um, and then some of these others, HHV6 is human herpes virus six, um, human herpes virus seven. Um, so basically these critters like to live in our brain tissue and and what happens is our immune system, the, the viruses generally, they don't die. They, they're just in a latent phase in our body once we get infected with some of these. And so our immune system keeps them in check. And, um, and so if our immune system is working well, then it's fine. But, um, but what happens is the immune system weakens with age or with other factors, and then some of these viruses will wake up. Um, one that I want to especially give some uh, time to is Lyme disease. Um, this is really a biggie in the infection world with regard to the brain. And Lyme disease is related to syphilis. So uh, many people might recall in the old days before antibiotics that um, men would get an STD or sexually transmitted disease and then it would seem to go away. And then, um, but what would happen is then some years down the road, the man would go crazy and he was demented. Um, and so it turns out that Lyme is related to syphilis and they're both spirochetes. They're actually the same class of organisms. So in some people, Lyme attacks the joints, but in other people, it doesn't affect their joints at all, but it goes into their brain and we can see brain symptoms and immune symptoms without the joint symptoms. So um, I think in my clinical trial, I turned up active Lyme in quite a few of the patients in my study. 
And pretty much, I think to a person, uh, none of them even had any recollection of being bitten by a tick. So these days, um, I don't, it's, I, it just needs to be part of a general workup. We need to test for Lyme and we need to test for the co-infections with Lyme as well. Um, okay, so this is really what I do. There's no time to lose with dementia. I wanna cast a wide net. We're racing the clock, right? If somebody's having cognitive problems, I don't wanna lose those three years that happened to my patient that I mentioned. So I do a lot of testing and I'm testing a lot of things. And um, it's always been a criticism of functional medicine. Well, they, they do too much testing. Well, we cannot know our treatment targets if we don't test. We need to do all of this testing up front and fix everything as quickly as we can and reverse these factors. Um, if you you know do one thing and then you still have 10 other things wrong and then you do another thing and you know you could be testing over two or three years and fixing things, but really you want to try to work hard and fast and, and get all of this stuff done. So um, this is a, probably what I was starting to talk about earlier, the aging and, and the decline in immune function. So, um, so we can have a decline in our immune function during times of major stress. And I think this last year would qualify for that for many of us. Um, and, and so um, what happens is when our immune system is depressed, then the viruses will wake up and reactivate and they can start multiplying again. And then some infections like Lyme disease in particular is known to further suppress the immune system. So what happens when these viruses wake up and reactivate and start replicating again, or they're not all viruses, some of them are bacteria, some of them are parasites, um, but when they start replicating, our body is designed to kill the invaders. And the way that it kills the invaders is that it creates inflammatory cytokines. And that's a word that a lot of people have learned this year if they didn't know it before, because we've learned about the cytokine storm that can happen with an exuberant immune response to the COVID illness. So um, we need inflammatory cytokines to help us heal when we have an infection or we have an injury and they're designed to kill the invaders, but they're giving off these you know, toxic destructive substances and so if we have a chronic infection or chronic inflammation in our brain and these cytokines are constantly turned on, then instead of just you know, killing a, an infection that it's having a hard time, it's gonna start killing the brain tissue. And that's one of the factors with immune, um, with the immune system here. So, um, so it's just really important to fortify your immune system and keep it well. I mean, this is the basis of any kind of general health, right? Eat well, sleep well, exercise, remove your body, reduce the stress. And, you know, there's just no way that you can stay healthy by eating processed food and fast food and taking vitamins. I do know people that do that. And they're like, well, I take all these vitamins. Well, that's just like swimming upstream for the salmon. You're, you're not going to get to where you need to with that. So um, for, for my work with dementia, in addition to, of course, having people eat, you know, whole food, fresh food, organic food, we also are very concerned with the carb content or the sugar content of the food. Um, so I tell people, see this equation in your head, carbs equal sugar. They're the same thing. The carbs are broken down into sugar. And, um, and you know, we were told um, all my life growing up, okay, eat lots of healthy whole grains and carbs. And it turns out that that's one of the big medical mistakes of the last century because everybody started eating all these whole grains and carbs and what happened was we got fat you know we have this huge obesity epidemic and the reason for that is the glycemic index of these grains which is the sugar content is extremely high the glycemic index of wheat is 20 percent higher than table sugar so um so I tell my patients, okay, you want to eat this big fluffy bagel? Well, you might as well be eating two candy bars for that. You know, so um, we know that sugar is toxic for our cells and for our blood vessels and for our neurons. And it's not an essential element. We don't need sugar <laughs> to survive. Um, and of course, you know, the sugar leads to obesity and then obesity leads to high blood pressure and diabetes and sleep apnea and heart disease and brain disease. And then another problem with obesity is when you are obese and you have a lot of a fat like a, around your waistline and mid-abdominal fat, 
that fat will secrete its own inflammatory cytokines. Mm -hmm. So with obesity, people are inflamed. It's just by the nature of the beast. And so then it becomes a, a tough thing. Their doctors say, well, just diet and exercise. And, and that isn't, that isn't sufficient when people are in that inflamed state, you have to take steps to, you know, reduce their inflammation or they can't lose the weight. So for the patients that I work with at, at a minimum, I ask them to avoid gluten. Um, that's the grain that has the highest glycemic index, and it's also our most common food allergen. Yeah, and uh, we also know that it, it elevates a protein in the lining of the gut called zonulin that leads to leaky gut. And, and there's a saying in our world, leaky gut equals leaky brain. So if your gut's not healthy and you have microscopic holes in your gut, then the food's going to get through and it gets into your bloodstream. And then that turns on your immune system and that releases those inflammatory cytokines that travel into your brain and activate things in your brain and wreak havoc there. So um, working with your gut health is a, a huge important um, factor in trying to uh, heal from anything. But we have to start with what, what we're eating. Um, so obviously, you know, fresh organic food, um, lots of vegetables, all the colors of the rainbow, um, free range meat, chicken and eggs and wild caught fish and also healthy fats. So I want to say just a little bit about fat and the brain. Um, basically, the brain is mostly fat. So if you think about the brain is just in that white spongy stuff, well, that is fat. And so second biggest medical mistake, or they're both equally bad medical mistakes, told us to eat a low fat diet. And I grew up with that dogma and I ate a low fat diet. And what happened for me, one of the many factors that I had to fix to get my brain to come back online was my cholesterol was too low. So my cholesterol was about 135 and that's not enough to support your brain. Um, so the brain is mostly fat and you've got to have those healthy fats to make, make the tissue in your brain. And then also we have our nerves and around each nerve is a myelin sheath. It's a coating that helps the, the nerve impulses to conduct. And that myelin sheath is made of fat. So the brain really, really suffers when we are not getting enough fat. And it turns out that cholesterol isn't the enemy. So now we're much more sophisticated about all these different lipoproteins and different you know, types of uh, fat carrying molecules and cholesterol is a healthy fat. And cholesterol is a precursor to all of our sex hormones. It's a precursor to our thyroid hormones and it's a precursor to our stress hormones like our cortisol. So if you don't have enough healthy fats, you're not gonna make all those hormones and your brain is going to suffer. One of the things that we're seeing now is dementia in people that have been treated with high doses of statin medications. So those are the medications to lower your lipids and your cholesterol. And what's happening is they've been given out like candy and uh, people are giving high doses. And I treated uh, one person that, was in his 90s and he didn't get demented till he was 90, which was meant that he was very healthy, like he was a good detoxifier and things were working. But as we unraveled the factors for him and what led to his dementia, he had been on a super dose of statins and his wow. cholesterol was 130 for years and years and years. So not enough to support his brain or his hormones. And then he was put on finasteride, which is um, a medicine for um, prostate enlargement and also for some people for hair loss. And it's a, a dreadful medicine because it blocks your testosterone. It blocks your conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, your most important testosterone. And that testosterone is yet another factor that is so important for the brain. So this guy had what I called iatrogenic dementia. The doctors created the dementia by doing what they thought was right. They put him on statins and they put him on finasteride and it blocked his cholesterol and it blocked his testosterone and you know after a certain amount of time it was too much for his brain to function so i have an interesting um, study from the world health organization that that looked at a meta-analysis of of um, all of these uh, different um, 
levels of cholesterol. And what they found was cholesterol in the range of 200 to 240 had the lowest all-cause mortality. So that means if your cholesterol is in that range, 200 to 240, you're least likely to die from anything. And they found that the lower cholesterols actually had increased risk for infections and parasitic diseases. And they thought that there was even a higher cardiovascular risk that was trending with the lower cholesterols. So, um, so just take away cholesterol's not the enemy, um, but there are lipid subparticles, some of them that are more likely to cause heart disease than others, the LP little a and the ApoB. So uh, we can now do panels with Quest and LabCorp. There's one at Quest that I like called the Cardio IQ. And it shows all of these different uh, lipid particles. And we definitely keep an eye on those because too much of the bad lipids is gonna clog up your blood vessels and it's gonna clog up the vessels in your brain and it leads to strokes and heart attacks and dementia. So, um, so but cholesterol is not the enemy. Uh, these are just a list of some of the healthy fats that I have people pour in, coconut, avocado, um, free range meat and chicken. Um, the free range meat is so important and it's really worth spending your money there. Um, if you can't get that, then stick more with the vegetables. Um, the, the feedlot beef is um, fed, fed grains to make them fat because if they're fat, they can sell more beef, but the fat makes them inflamed just like it makes us inflamed and then they're often you know kept in high stress situations so their cortisol stress hormones are high and that makes more inflammation and basically you can see when you look at the the studies of the feedlot beef compared to the free-range beef um, the free-range beef is very high in omega-3 fatty acids that's the fish oil we take that's very anti-inflammatory and it's very low in omega-6 fatty acids which is a pro-inflammatory fatty acid we we need some of that, but we don't want to have too much of it. But when you look at the feedlot beef, that ratio is flipped. So they're very high in the omega-6s, which are pro-inflammatory, and they're very low in those therapeutic healthy omega-3s. So um, that's a place definitely, if at all possible, spend the money. Oops, I spelled chicken wrong on there. Um, so another thing to know about the fats, and this is important um, from the world of dementia, is that sometimes when people shift into ketosis, um, where they're burning fats for fuel, their brains work better. And our bodies are designed to either burn carbs for fuel or fats for fuel. And, and so if we uh, stop eating carbs or we drive our carbs down to a very low level, then our body needs fuel and it shifts into burning fat for fuel. And the liver then breaks down the fat and creates these different molecules called ketones. And so those are fuels. And, um, and so we find that sometimes when people shift and they eat the low carb, high fat diet and get into ketosis, their thinking just gets really clear and they have a lot more energy as well. So um, as part of our clinical trial, we actually had everybody go into ketosis and stay into ketosis for the duration of the trial. And, um, and it's, uh, I would say it's, 50-50. Some people don't notice a thing and other people feel so much better with ketosis and um, that they, they want to stay there. We don't have any data to say long-term ketosis is safe or the way to go. We don't have data saying it's harmful either, but um, uh, you know what I find at the end of the trial, most of my patients would do ketosis part of the week and maybe some days have a little bit higher carbs like sweet potatoes and things that... Um, that uh, they were missing with their ketosis diet. Um, but um, the one caveat with the ketones is that um, some people, when you give them a very high fat diet, will elevate their lipids. So I do keep an eye on that. And the teaching has been the people that have the ApoE4 genes, which are the Alzheimer genes, um, they tend to store things as fat. It's called the fat bucket gene, and you do tend to store store a lot of your calories as fat. But um, so so some people say don't ever give a ApoE4 people a high saturated fat diet. And you know what? They're, that's not true. And I have the data in my study to show that I have people with ApoE4 genes, and some of them their lipids got better and not worse eating a high fat diet. And yet I had a patient that was an Apo33 that should not technically be a problem with a higher saturated fat diet and her lipids did go up and I 
had to switch her to, um, you know, le less coconut and more of the olive oil and the, the um, less saturated fat with her diet. Um, another concept that we employ a lot of is um, time restricted eating. So it's kind of a form of intermittent fasting, but um, with the time restricted eating, we know that um, if you eat less calories, you're going to live longer. So it, it promotes longevity just basically to eat less calories. Um, and so what, what researchers have found is if we can limit our food intake to eight or 10 hours of the day, and you know what, for some people that's 12 hours a day. And you know, some people, some people can't do this safely. Their adrenals are shot and you know, their blood sugar will crash and they need to eat. But, but many, many people do find, <clears throat> excuse me, that they can easily limit their food to eight or 10 or 12 hours of the day. And then you don't eat for a, a large period of time. And, and a bunch of interesting things happen with that. Um, we know that it promotes autophagy, which is an interesting process that helps to clean up um, uh, cellular debris and turn on good genes. And, and uh, it's, a, it's just a, a, good, a lot of good things happen with that. Um, but um, when, when you are um, restricting your calories and you're getting into that autophagy state, it can lower your blood sugar, it can lower your LDL cholesterol, which is one of the cholesterols that we don't want too much of. It can reduce inflammation, including neuroinflammation in our brain. And um, so this is an easy practice that a lot of people can do pretty easily. Um, and um, basically the best results are if you eat every day at the same time, and you fast every day at the same time. So that just helps you to maintain a healthy circadian rhythm and the circadian rhythms of our time of eating and sleeping um, and regenerating our organs, um, kind of honoring those rhythms. There's a lot of magical good things that happen with that. Okay, your brain on sleep. So sleep is a huge factor for the immune system and for the brain. And um, I think uh, you'll have other speakers on the lymphatic system, but what we've learned only in the last couple of years is that we have this whole lymphatic system. Our lymphatic system is, a, is our system of lymph nodes that helps to detox things and clean out things in our body. And we have a special system in our brain called the lymphatics. And those lymphatics go into action when we sleep. So when we sleep, then all the cerebrospinal fluid in the ventricles of our brain expands in size quite a bit, and it starts churning and swirling like a washing machine. And they say that that helps to clean out all of the toxins that have gotten into the brain and accumulated during the day. So here's a really important thing to think about. If you're chronically not getting enough sleep, then you could be building up excess toxins that can do long-term harm to your brain. So if you miss an hour or two here or there, that's not really a problem. But look at the numbers that I worked out. If you're chronically getting six hours a night of sleep, well, that's 17 hours a week less detox, 60 hours a month, and 730 hours a year that you're cheating your, you're cheating your brain of its ability to detox. So keep that in mind. Um, sleep is just vitally important. And, and, you know, when we sleep is when our organs, not only our brain, but all of our liver, our kidneys, that's when all of our organs are regenerating uh, when we're sleeping. Okay, sleep apnea. Um, another big pitfall and danger for the brain. And, you know, we worry when somebody has a seizure and they temporarily don't get enough oxygen to their brain. But when you have sleep apnea, it's like having that happen like all night long every night. And the two organs of our body that require the most oxygen are our brains and our hearts. So that's what's going to suffer when we have sleep apnea. The brain will really suffer and the neurons start to atrophy when they're not getting enough oxygen. Oxygen, and then it also puts a tremendous strain on the heart. So untreated sleep apnea very often leads to congestive heart failure. And these days I test all of my cognitive patients for sleep apnea. I have a nice home sleep study device that, um, that I can check out to my patients and it uses a high intensity pulse oximeter and it, it'll measure the oxygen all through the night. It measures the heart rate variability. And what I have people do is I ask them to record for three nights in a row, because sometimes I'll see people that have one or two nights that, that look just fine. And then I'll have a night that looks really dicey and I send them to the sleep lab and they have sleep apnea. 
But um, these days, most of the sleep labs, the conventional sleep labs where you go and you get hooked up to the wires and you sleep in the horrible place all night with all those wires, most of them now have these home sleep study devices. And I think that's a great place to start. So um, if you ask your doctor for a sleep study, ask if you can do the home op option. I think it's more realistic because you're in your natural environment. And then, you know, if you can do it for a couple nights in a row, it's, it's even better. Um, and I really want to make the point that you don't have to be male and overweight to have sleep apnea. You, I have found sleep apnea in thin women who don't snore. So you don't have to snore to have sleep apnea either. It's just one of those things, just like all those infections, you've got to test it to make sure and just rule that out. But if you have it, I um, mean, there's been a lot of progress. If it's mild sleep apnea, people can wear dental devices that kind of pull their jaw forward and keep their airway open. It's not an automatic uh, you know, prescription for CPAP, but CPAP can be life-changing for people and it can be huge for their cognition. You can see their cognition improve very quickly when they've been having untreated sleep apnea. Okay, let's That's go interesting, on. there's home testing now. I've, I've never done a sleep study, but I've always seen the images and the pictures of like being hooked up to 27 things sitting in a lab, like yeah. white coat <laughs> people and people staring at you and whatever. And I'm like, well, of course they're gonna sleep terribly in that environment. Like how, right. I, I wouldn't be able to fall asleep laying there like this with all the things on, like I would sleep, I'm a pretty good sleeper and I would sleep terribly in that place. So I'm, I'm glad they've kind of wisened up to that. I think the results in sleep studies could be very skewed. Yes, no, it is. And, you know, I mean, and children have um, sleep apnea. Um, it's, it was, it's a factor in children with ADHD. And I think that children with ADHD should be tested as well. Because um, anything that's irritating your brain is going to cause changes in your thinking and your behavior. Okay, so let's talk a, a little bit about replace. So, you know, we work to identify all the things we can remove, and then we need to figure out what else do we need to put back in to get things to work. And once again, I do a lot of testing um, and look at all kinds of nutrient levels. Um, here's a list of some uh, common nutrient deficiencies that will increase your dementia risk um, and affect cognitive functioning. Um, and um, some of these are actually hormones. The vitamin D is not just a vitamin, it's a hormone. And, and we have vitamin D receptors in our brains and, and it's a, it's a, vitamin D is protective, it's an antioxidant. Um, but we find that when the vitamin D levels are low that people's brains decline quite a bit more rapidly with aging. And they, the normal vitamin D level, if you get a lab test, it'll say the range is 30 to 100. But I like to have it 50 to 80. So you don't want to be at the bottom of the range. You want to kind of be in the middle of the range for the most optimal functioning. Well, if your vitamin D level is less than 30, it will increase your risk of Alzheimer's by 53%. And if it's less than 20 it will increase your risk by 125%. There's this huge correlation with vitamin D and the brain. And it's so easy to test. You can just ask your doctor to order a vitamin D level. It's not an expensive test and just adjust your supplements to get your vitamin D level to that range of 50 to 80. Um, and you know, we evolved at the equator, right? I mean, you know, early man came at the equator and we had full sun at the equator. But we, I live here in the San Francisco Bay Area, so we're quite a bit farther north than the equator. And nobody that I test has enough vitamin D. I have tested, you know, hundreds and th probably thousands of people now. I, I've tested every patient for the last 10 years of doing functional medicine. And I've only had, I had one patient that had a super high vitamin D level for no reason. It was something genetic and no doctors could figure out why she was high. And I had one other patient who came to see me from San Diego and she was a swimming instructor in San Diego. She was in the water all day and pretty far south. But she told me that she could get away without supplementing in the summer, but in the winter, her levels dropped to the point that she had to supplement. But those are the only two people that I've ever found enough vitamin D in. So, you know, these days we are learning about some of the things that increase our risk factor for COVID. And, and the two biggest things of increasing your risk for COVID really are vitamin D deficiency and zinc deficiency. So those are easy things to just, you know, take prophylactically. And, 
So I tell people uh, vitamin D tends to come in 2000 IUs, 5000 IUs and 10,000 IUs. So I tell people, if you don't know your level, okay, take 2000, but as soon as you can get a level, get your level and, and adjust it, because I would say more than half of my patients need five to 10,000 IUs in order to, to keep a good level of vitamin D. And, and another one that's worth extra mention is the B12. So B, B12 levels have long been part of a dementia workup, but all of these B vitamins are important for our brain to work. Um, and we tend to absorb less and less of our vitamins with aging, the stomach acid changes. And so it's very common with aging to have some nutritional deficiencies with, with vitamins. So it's worth, worth testing. And again, it's so easy to fix B12, um, but if I get really low levels, I'll you know put people until I can get their gut fixed and have them absorbing, I'll put them on B12 injections. And that's something else that sometimes you can see an immediate improvement in people. Um, so easy to fix those things. The um, homocysteine is a, a marker that I guess I don't have on this. It's not a, a, a nutrient, but it's something we measure. And a, a low homocysteine level is another risk factor for dementia. And basically that's indicative of a B12 or a folate or a B6 deficiency. So, um, so there's a lot of markers that we can test and follow and just get all of these things optimized to help the brain work well. Um, a, a little word about mitochondrial nutrients. So mitochondria are the powerhouses of our cell and they generate ATP, which is our cellular energy that drives all of our functions in our body and our processes. And when you have a neurodegenerative disorder or an immune disorder, your mitochondria are under siege and they're suffering. They're trying to keep up with the demands of whatever's attacking your body. So um, I find it useful um, with, with um, cognitive decline, certainly to um, you know, add um, some extra mitochondrial support for people. And we can actually measure levels of some of these things like CoQ10, we can measure, we can measure glutathione levels and uh, the um, NAC and glutathione turn out to be super helpful nutrients for the COVID prevention as well. That the NAC, um, in addition to helping your mitochondria, it's actually directly protective of lung tissue. And, um, and that's what we're trying to protect from the COVID virus. And NAC turns into glutathione, which is our most important antioxidant. So, um, you know, for COVID prevention, kind of my top three things I tell people, make sure you're taking vitamin D and zinc and NAC. Um, but what's good for that is also good for our brains here. Um, I like people just to be on, you know, I have three core supplements that, that I just think everybody needs to be on because we don't get enough from our foods. And that's the fish oil, the B complex and the vitamin D. And then, you know, if need be additional B12 and um, there's the notes about COVID and the NAC and the zinc. Um, I use a lot more nutrients depending on what I find in people and what they're deficient. Um, but I think those are basic healthy things that everybody could take just to prevent and support their brain. Um, so let me talk now about the hormones because I think the big things people are missing with dementia, I mean, there's you know, everybody's understanding that diet and lifestyle and exercise and meditation and all these things can, can help the brain. But, but what we don't want to miss are the infections and the toxins and the lack of hormones. So the hormones, um, again, it's something easy to measure and easy to replace, but we have receptors for all of these sex hormones in our brains. It's, they're not the sex hormones aren't just for our sexual organs and our sexual functioning, but our brains have receptors for estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, pregnenolone, DHEA, and this is in men and women. Women have testosterone receptors and men have estrogen receptors. We just might not have as many of them, you know, in the the different genders. But um, it's so important to. Um, to maintain these hormone levels, we just have a growing body of research that when we lose these, the, the hormones, like with menopause, it's menopause for women, which is somewhat abrupt. And men uh, is called andropause, but men also with aging gradually lose their, their sex hormones. Um, and we're seeing those hormones though be disrupted earlier and earlier because we have all of these endocrine disrupting um, hormones that we're exposed to in, you know, our skin products, our hair products, our foods, and um, 
And then also some of the infections like the Lyme disease gets in the brain and disrupts the HPA or hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And if you have an infection in your brain, it's gonna disrupt the production of these hormones. So I actually have you know, young men in their 20s that I'm having to treat with testosterone because they have Lyme disease that's disrupted their testosterone production. So, so there was a really interesting study that Stanford did a few years ago, and they took women at risk for Alzheimer's that had been on hormone replacement, and they randomized them either to stay on their hormones or stop their hormones. And they followed them for two years and they did head scans and neuropsych testing. And what they found at the end of two years is that 100% of the women who stopped their hormones had cognitive decline. And they could see it on the head scans. Like it was pretty obvious. And it didn't matter whether they were synthetic hormones or bioidentical hormones. If they stop those hormones, their neurons started to degenerate. Now, obviously, these days we want to only use bioidentical hormones. Um, they don't have a risk for cancer like the, the old synthetic hormones did. Um, but I had people tell me, well, you know, it's not natural to take hormones after menopause, but really it's not natural to live 30 or 40 years past menopause. So in, until the last century, you know, our life expectancies were quite a bit different than they are now. And so, you know, if we live 10 years past menopause and our brain degenerated, it might not be that significant, but if you're planning to live, um, you know, for 20 or 30 or 40 years, then you might want to look into um, protecting your hormones here. And that would not be just the sex hormones, but obviously the thyroid hormones are important. I think I have cannabinoids on my list here. We actually have CBD receptors in the brain and uh, there is a growing, you know, body of research showing that, um, that, um, um, giving things to help the destruction of the CBD um, receptors in the brain can be helpful for, for brain function. Okay, I'm gonna try to talk a little faster. I know there's so much to say on this. Um, the third R is regenerate. So, you know, we've got to remove and replace, but we also want to heal the brain and try to make new neuronal connections in the brain. And um, that's what we call neuroplasticity. And, um, and so, the way that we can grow new neurons or make new neuronal connections is by stimulating them. And the two of the best validated ways that we have very clear to make new neurons in our brain are exercise and meditation. And both of these exercise and meditation both increase levels of a hormone called BDNF, and that means brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So neurotrophic means it's trophic or life-giving for the neurons, and that BDNF helps us to make new neuronal connections. So as part of our dementia clinical trial, one of the you know the, we had a lot of requirements that people had to do, but basically they had to exercise six days a week, and they did a combination of aerobic exercise and strength training exercise and also high intensity interval training, which is called HIIT for short. And that's where you exercise as hard as you can for one or two minutes. And, um, and then you can you know, repeat that if you want. But the, the data for um, high intensity interval training is just fabulous that literally one or two minutes can cause hormonal changes and cascades that can improve your lipids and your blood sugar and your inflammation and your brain. So, um, so um, definitely exercise is, it's, you know, it's, it's not an expensive medication. Everybody can find a way to do that. And it's a critical part of saving your brain. Um, and then the other thing is something meditative or mindfulness. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, traditional meditation. You can do guided meditations. You can do Tai Chi or Qigong. Um, I, in our study, what we had people do um, is we used a uh, heart math and heart math is a wonderful um, device that I, I call it meditation for non meditators. These days you can get a little sensor that you put on your ear and it's measuring your heart rate variability. Roland gave a presentation. So Roland McGrady. Presentation? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so we have, a, if you want to learn more about her fun non meditation meditation tool and you want to dive into that, go check out Roland McCready's presentation. It's entirely on coherence, mind, body, brain, and heart math. He's the, he's the lead researcher over there at the heart math. Exactly. So, 
Exactly. And he's been at it for more than 20 years and they have beautiful data. And many, I have many friends who are experienced meditators who said that when they started doing heart math, it actually informed their meditation and it deepened their meditation. Um, but heart math in and of itself is an amazing little device and it's so easy to use. Even children can use it. And we know that 12 minutes a day of meditation or mindfulness or you know, being in that parasympathetic Zen mode will change your brain. And you don't even have to do those 12 minutes all at once. You can do four minutes, three times a day and still you know, get changes for your brain. So it's really, how can you fit all this into your life and find little ways to, to get it in there? But, um, but basically anything that stimulates your brain is going to help it to grow. So another thing that, um, that we used in our study and that I encourage my patients to do is Brain HQ. And um, Brain HQ is a, a, a program that you can do on your computer or your cell phone, and it's brain games. And they also are doing tremendous research. I'm getting new research studies from them all the time, um, but um, they have great data that shows that um, doing some of these brain training uh, there's a couple of them in particular, double decision and, oh gosh, I'm blanking on the other one. Um, but it can, 10 years down the road, people that went through a 40 hours of doing this program and didn't do it, 10 years later had a dramatically reduced risk of Alzheimer's. But what we saw in our study, so our patients uh, did the Brain HQ for, um, I think they did it for 12 minutes a day. And uh, so many of them did it longer. Um, but, um, but, you know, I, I could track that and I could see that where they started, they actually improved their scores by about 22% um, over the course of the study. It, and it gets harder. The thing with Brain HQ is if you get better, they make the levels harder. So, um, so actually improving is a really good thing. It shows that you're, you're gaining a lot of, a lot of ground there. Um, so, um, so basically that's, uh, I just I wanna give a one-liner on hearing and vision and dental. So um, midlife hearing loss is a risk factor for dementia. And when we lose our hearing, we're losing those inputs, the firing from our ears into our brain. And so um, it's really important, um, you know, after middle age to start testing your hearing. And definitely if you end up having loss where you could correct it by hearing aids, get those sooner rather than later. That will protect your brain. Same thing with your glasses. Um, the, the eyes can change more rapidly with aging. It's really a great idea to get your glasses checked every year and adjusted because again, what's coming through your eyes is stimulating your brain. And the last thing I'll just say is the, the dental. We've discovered that many of the microbes that live in the mouth can translocate into the brain. And so um, staying on top of periodontal disease and using dental picks and if need be uh, the um, water picks and things like that and making sure that your dental health is as pristine as possible is one more thing that will save your brain. Okay, so I just, I just have some resources here that um, maybe Michael can uh, um, make available where to get the mold testing, the heart math, the brain HQ. Yep. We'll make sure they get all the, all the links. The brain HQ is a new one for me. So I'll, I'll make sure to get that link on there. The, the heart math actually gave us a, they have a digital e little e-course that teaches about heart rate variability and things that they've okay. made free that Oh, that's the great. access things that when somebody signed up for this masterclass, they get to go do the heart math experience and you, they don't, you don't get the gizmo, but they teach you about it and everything. It's a nice little video course. So in your welcome email from when you signed up for this, there's a, a cool link for, for heart math. And I, I've had it for five years, my little uh, device, my wife and I call it the bing bong because of the sounds that it makes. And um <laughs> I found that I do pretty advanced meditation techniques and I've definitely found a shift in both. Like learning the advanced meditation techniques allowed me to do better with the with the heart math. Yeah. And then doing the heart math regularly shifts my meditation practice. And it's not the same doing, right. but they seem to be really related. And I, I recommended it to several people who don't like meditation or say they can't do meditation. Right. Uh, because it's a much different way to get to the same place. So. Exactly. And they'll both, they'll both get you there. And yeah, yeah. The route doesn't matter. It's really great for anxiety as well. And mm -hmm. 
they have, you know, I don't know if he mentioned it, but nice data with college students, if they do it regularly, that they could, you know, do it just for two minutes to quickly shift into that Zen state before they had to take a test or do a presentation and it will actually change the outcomes. But it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful device. And the Brain HQ has data for depression. I um, mean, they have, you know, certain things for, for um, ADHD and processing speed. So they're also doing fantastic work. And, um, and, you know, Christmas is coming up and I'll bet both HeartMath and Brain HQ are probably gonna have a Christmas special. So Yeah, so we'll make sure to get them. you the links and you can check it out. And um, yeah, they'd be great stocking stuffers and not just for people higher in age too. These things are great for kids and younger people. Um, They're great kids people. love the, the HeartMath because it gives like immediate feedback as to how you're doing so you can win or improve or get scores. and. I use it for a few minutes at a time like that. Like right before I do a presentation, like one of these, sometimes yeah. I'll jump yeah. on for a few minutes or if I get off like a stressful meeting or call or something and I need to shift into something else, it really helps me kind of let go of whatever was going on and transition into something else. And it's kind of like going in the forest for a few minutes without ha having access to a forest. But I guess I guess you can visualize that. Visualize the forest, yeah. The forest, your, right? Your scores will go up. Yes, yeah, because there's so much nice data coming about the benefits of being out in the forest, right? And how how that changes our brain. And you know, I love the oxytocin hit with the um, with the heart math. I I have an old heart math uh, before they had the sensors. I have that one too, but I have the old handheld. And and you put your thumb on the device, and and you're in the red zone. And then it starts telling you just breathe in and breathe out. And they're synchronizing it with your heart. And so as soon as I start the breathing, I go into the blue zone. And the third component that I learned was then you think of someone you love. And when I think of someone I love go right into the green zone. And that's uh, that's you know, actually a hormonal cascade. When we think of someone we love, we the oxytocin is released from our brain, which is the love hormone or the bonding hormone. And it has just beautiful calming effects on our nervous system. So yeah, it's the coolest device. I do think it's wonderful. Yeah, Roland was super fun to talk to too. He's like, he's the same thing. He's like, this presentation could be 20 hours long. What do you want me to talk about? Because they've been yeah. doing the research for decades. and. There's more research on it than I knew or anticipated. And he shared some pretty mind blowing stuff. So yeah, definitely yeah. go check that one out and look for stocking stuffers, the heart math and the, the brain HQ. Is that an app? Uh, yeah, it's an app or I mean, it goes on your, they have an app and you can do it on the desktop. And if okay. you wanna track your progress, it can be easier on the desktop, but you can have it on your um, your cell phone. So I tell people, look, if you got to go to the doctor and you're waiting and they're keeping you waiting, well, just play your games, you know, get a little hit for your brain there instead of getting aggravated. So um, it is nice that, that you can do both. And I, I wanted to mention, uh, I've been starting to load some of my talks on my YouTube channel. So I do have one uh, talk there that I did at, at Age Management for Medicine Group um, last fall that um, gets into some of these things in more detail than I had the time to get into today. But um, hopefully I'll be able to uh, finish cranking on my book and put things in a more logical sequence to help people understand all the details there's a lot of details but you know really i just i want to leave people with the notion that dementia is not a death sentence and and you know spread the word on that and tell everybody you know like don't let it slide um, because there's reasons that it happens and so we don't have to just accept that we have to get our affairs in order no we have to get our lives in order and our health in order but but dementia does not have to be a death sentence. So we really want to change that perception. And, and, and I think it's going to help a lot of people to understand that. You're one of the, the leading voices of changing that perception. So um, I'm really grateful for the presentation. There's so much excellent material here. I have frantic notes scribbled all over my, <laughs> my paper. And um, some things for me to think about is this is something like I do think about myself, like my brain health is something that I'm concerned about. I have, like I mentioned at the beginning, I have a lot of risk factors. I do notice uh, writing and typing my, I'll, I'll miss words sometimes now and, and little things that aren't really that bad quote, but right. they're definitely things I'm noticing. And now that I've learned 
all these different risk factors and all these different things to look for, I do see more of it. So luckily I have a network of incredibly brilliant <laughs> functional neurology wizards. So I am gonna start looking into a lot more of this myself. And um, I'm just grateful for all that you're doing and really looking forward to the research being published and the book coming out. So we'll have to have you back again to talk about the research in the book when those come out. And if we're ever allowed to do human things again. No, uh, when, well, not well, if, when, 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 when we'll, we're we'll, we'll go uh, do some lunch over there. Maybe I'll, I'll visit the grandmother-in-law and then swing by and we'll do lunch. So yeah, that, that would be great. Well, thank you for all that you're doing to help, you know, get this, this word and all these teachings. I know you have a lot of excellent, you know, friends and mentors and people of mine on this, uh, mm -hmm. on this series that you're doing. And um, thank you so much for having me as well. I really appreciate it. You guys are doing the hard work. I'm just trying to be the mouthpiece and get the, the megaphone and get the it's platform. It's important, it, so. right? Because we, you know, we need to get the word out. So yeah, yeah. it's important. We appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kat. Really appreciate thank it. Oh, thank you. Bye.